I'm your host, Stephen Vanover, here on the Sports Talk Line Network, where we talk sports 24-7, 365. This is Sports Talk Line, NFC East edition, and we're here tonight with Nate Dowdy, the man with no remorse. Good evening, sir. Yeah, as far as I'm concerned, it's fight week. I got my <laughs> Cassius Clay shirt on, so hey. There it subject. is, there it is. And then also from New York City, Mr. Tom McAllister. Good evening, sir. Thanks for having me. And the fight Nate is talking about is the fight between the Dallas Cowboy coaches and the Dallas Cowboys players. Yeah, I think Ooh. there's a bigger fight there than there was on the field. Uh, that's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, and uh, hey, before we get started in here, if you've not already, please hit that subscribe button down below, that little notify bell, give that a tickle too. And then on whichever social media platform you're watching this, please give it a retweet, a like, a repost, whatever you got to do. Without you guys, this does not happen. This is the NFC East Week 6 Review. And I just wanted to talk to everyone out there. I was researching for stats about how bad the NFC East historically this season. And uh, a guy, Jay Busby from Yahoo Sports, actually had done a lot of the research for me. And I'm just going to highlight some of the stuff. All four teams have a combined five wins. That's the same as the Seahawks, Bears, Steelers, Ravens, Titans, and Chiefs. Let that sink in. The Chicago Bears have as many wins as the entire NFC <laughs> East. All right. I think Trubisky even helped them out. All right. The division is a combined 518 and 1. To get to 500, every team in the division would have to win every week through week 11. Outside the division, only two NFC East teams have only two wins Dallas over Atlanta, which wasn't really a win, was it, Nate? That was a gift. Oh, it was a win. <laughs> All right, I'll take it. And then, of course, uh, Philadelphia over San Francisco. And that week, Tom, as we were talking in the green room, uh, San Francisco was just blown up uh, with all the injuries in the world. So, mm -hmm. and also, here, here's one of the key ones. The Eagles, Giants, and Washington, okay, three of the teams, have three of the six worst cumulative QBR, quarterback ratings, in the league. So three of the six worst belong to NFC East teams. And strangely enough, to cap that off, the number one QB, and so far as yardage, in the league heading into week seven in the NFL is Dak Prescott. Yeah, that's what happens when you're behind. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you know, that that is the NFC East. It's epically bad and as I was mentioning to Tom the the team that I think the fans feel best about right now in the NFC East is the Giants and that's because they had zero expectations for the Giants right yes uh, I totally agree I think with Eli Manning's retirement uh, a lot of the Giant fans and a lot of the pundits uh, could put away for the most part what would be a pipe dream of the Giants making another magical run to the Super Bowl title with Eli Manning at quarterback um, even though it went from bad to worse with Saquon Barkley getting hurt in week two. Um, some rookies on the offensive line haven't developed as much, but there has been some upside with the Giants. Um, their defense has overachieved. Um, James Bradbury is playing at a Pro Bowl level. He is a top two cornerback in the NFL, according to Pro Football Focus. Um, he's been a lockdown corner. Just ask Amari Cooper. Um, he learned that last week. Um and you look at the Giants' defensive line. We have uh, the uh, from last week against the Cowboys. But when also looking at the Giants' defense, look at their interior line. Leonard Williams is a top twenty-five defensive lineman now. They have the New York Giants have five top forty interior linemen on their roster right now. Yeah, um, they're, they're, they're actually playing some pretty good defense. I would have yeah. to agree with you hundred percent. Their defense has been playing. Uh, exceptional, definitely above. A lot of people thought the secondary would be a weakness, but that hasn't happened so far this season. The issue has been offensively. Well, and Daniel uh, Jones finally had a game where he didn't, uh, you know, turn the ball over, right? No, nope, not yet. He's getting oh. close. He, he's <laughs> cut it down to one. Um, I do believe Daniel Jones has the same amount of red zone interceptions as he has touchdowns, um, which is not a good stat you want. You know, two of those Red zone turnovers came on long 10-plus plays 
nine minute plus drives and the Giants weren't able to cash in on it. And it's kind of getting repetitive again. And it's, you got to wonder if, you know, I think the New York Giants have 104 pressures this year, but another shining beacon on the Giants offense was the potential emergence of Matt Pert. He was the third round pick out of UConn for offensive tackle. Granted, Andrew Thomas was drafted in the first round. He was starting at left tackle. He hasn't really lived up to full expectations. Um, they benched him because Matt Pert showed up late, to, or not Matt Pert, because um, Andrew Thomas showed up late to a meeting. Matt Pert got some reps. And according to PFF, Pro Football Focus, Matt Pert has an 82.7 grade on PFF, a 91.7 grade on rushing. So it looks like the Giants' offensive line finally has an identity. It's starting to gel. It's starting, you know, they're they're starting to gel. And they have more talent that's going to be coming available to them next season. They're going to have some interesting uh, decisions to make. But Mm -hmm. let's actually dive in there. So, you know, let's give uh, the week review. The first game that we're going to look at is the Washington football team versus the New York Giants in New York. Well, actually, I should say in New Jersey. Um, (laughs) Yeah, let's let's be accurate here. Okay, um, it was a darn good football game. It was entertaining to watch, but man, I at a certain point I was curious why Joe Judge wasn't more aggressive. There was some fourth downs that I thought were definitely downs he should have gone for it. The offense was doing fairly well. Freeman I thought was moving the ball fairly well, but on the flip side, Washington was going for everything, man. I mean mm-hmm. everything. Even down at the end of the game where they went for the two-point play and the Giants held them. So on one side, a super aggressive team. And on the other side, I thought a team that was measured. I I think, you know, Riverboat Ron, um, he gambled twice. Once it paid off and once it blew up in his face. Um, There was one play towards the end of the second half where the end of the first half where it looked like the Giants defense would finally get that elusive stop to close the first half. Um, it was a third and long. They run into the kicker. It was about fourth and four. Riverboat run goes for it. They convert for it. They end that drive with a touchdown. So uh, once again. You know, actually, six- and that punt, they managed to down it on the one-yard line, on the one-foot line. Yes. But because of that penalty, they brought it back to fourth and four instead of fourth and nine. And mm-hmm. Riverboat run, like you said, went for that. And I was going like, Whoa. That's yes. uh, that's uh, that's mighty aggressive because not only are you saying okay we're going to go for it here, but you're taking a special teams play off the board that put the other team in a huge hole. Yes, I, I mean I kind of had visions of a Daniel Jones interception, um, but it turns out that didn't happen. Um, also, the second time uh, Ron Rivera went for it was you know after that touchdown the extra point would have tied up the game right it's one and four you know what they're on the road go for it and you got to credit the giants defensive line they're able to get in there create pressure and kyle allen wasn't able to get the pass off so that was something you know it finally gives joe judge that victory um a lot of people when you look at the actual game field they see improvements they like the direction some parts of the giants are making But I I kept on asking if the losses mount. I honestly thought if the Giants lost this week, Dave Gettleman's without a job effective immediately. Um, And now they can kind of go to let's evaluate and see what we have going forward. Well, they have an offensive line. And let me ask you this. Uh, Here is the thing that all Giants fans need to know. All right. Uh, Daniel Jones. Yes, he's getting better every week. But he still hasn't addressed that one problem. Has he? Yes, that one major problem, which is his ability to turn the ball over, which is extremely frustrating. Um, one of the things that he had, the Giants have added to the offense, is the run pass option. And Daniel Jones made a beautiful play in the first half against Washington for a dynamic 40 plus yard run. And that's yeah. another feat that I think will help the Giants' offense down the line. But turnovers at the crucial time. Daniel Jones can make solid to spectacular plays, but one turnover can negate all of that. And, and especially when it's like in the end zone, you know? Okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that kind of thing. Zone, 
return for a touchdown or sets up a touchdown. Well, congrats, Not- congrats on on the first one of the season. Talking mm-hmm. about Washington real quick. Uh, again, Chase Young. Uh, he's coming back, you know, from his injuries, so he wasn't at 100 percent. But he's still he's making those plays in the run game and the pass game. He's running down the line from the backside. You can't run at him. You can't run away from him. The guy, again, who I thought was stepping his game up, though, was Montez Sweat. From what you saw the game, do you agree with that, Tom? Yeah, Montez Sweat, you know, he was a dual threat. He was able to make plays to stop the run, able to make plays to disrupt the passing game. Um, Because sometimes you'll get some defensive players, especially on the defensive line, that just focus on one, either getting the sacks or stopping the run. But he's someone that can do both. And it, it goes to show that, Similar to the Giants, Washington has a young, solid defense with some spectacular players up front. And yeah. that can erase a lot of the issues you have in the secondary. Uh, you know, it is what it is. Uh, b- both teams are in similar boats, though with one team, the Giants, it feels like they're actually going somewhere, whereas the other uh, team, <laughs> the Washington, just feels like they're bailing water, man. Just, you know, come on, try it. Try to find that hole. They didn't, you know, they got too many holes. It's, uh, it's yeah. weird. Mm-hmm. All right, well, let's, let's jump on to the next game. Uh, and I'm talking about the Ravens. And, they, you know, they went up to Philly. And, uh, man, I tell you what, it was an interesting game for a while. Uh, but the Ravens are just very powerful. And Philadelphia is just very inept. Um, they got too many holes. They're like the Cowboys, but better. It starts with that offensive line sucking bad, and then their defense just has so many holes in it right now. Uh, Nate, what do you think about you know the whole Philadelphia Eagles situation? Congratulations, you've won the NFC East. That's what I've got to say. I mean, yeah. they won the NFC. They won the NFC East. I mean. Let's put it uh, this. There's no way to skin that other game. Both of those teams are one of the worst teams in the league. They're not going anywhere at either one of them. There's no way to put a positive spin on that, except for the fact that you're in the Trevor Lawrence race. Uh, But going further ahead, this is probably the Eagles probably best half of football they played in the second half of the game when they played against Baltimore. I mean, if you're to rewind back to 2019, no one was coming back against Baltimore in the second half. That was a death trap. Uh, now, yeah, absolutely. With that being said, Carson Wentz was playing with C-level to D-level receivers out there and was still making plays. There were several dropped passes that came in opportune times, one on the third down and 20 that hit the receiver right in the hands, and he just dropped it. And another time, Miles Sanders dropped a touchdown pass that hit him right in the hands. So it was Carson Wentz's best half of football, which still, to be said, he turned the ball over. And he actually leads the NFL in turnovers at the moment with 11. So it's they're going through the time of the same issues with the Cowboys that they still have a a starting quarterback. They're they're obliterated on the offensive line. They have a little bit more talent on defense than Dallas. So, but who does it? (laughs) Yeah. So. Do you think the issues with Philadelphia are related to quarterback play or the quarterback doesn't have enough talent around him? I think it has to do with the pressure that has to do with the lack of talent around him. So he's trying to make, he's trying to play above what he needs to do. Um, He hasn't had to do that previously, uh, except last year at times he did, uh, he did have some injuries on the receiver, the receiving end of things, but this year, it takes it to a different level. At least they had depth on the offensive line before. Now they're about without the right tackle, right guard, left tackle, who basically was uh, was standing out there with a red cape out there and said, Toro, basically any defender that was rushing. Um, well, you know, guys, what do you think about this? I mean, there's really types of, of QBs in the NFL. You got your backup QB, and they, they do it several different ways. But the number one thing that the backup QB, the, the journeyman QB in the NFL does, is uh, they're great in camp, man. They'll be in their camp. They'll be throwing that. In, and then they're great in preseason. And then, uh, and then you'll have your QBs that are your mobile QBs that will help hide holes in your offensive scheme. 
All right, uh, Tony Romo was a perfect example. Uh, look, look what he was able to do for the Cowboys, uh, even though their offensive line was, was a shambles. Dak Prescott is a perfect example. They make your team better, but of course, a team like that never does well in the playoffs if they make the playoffs, because then at that point, you know, balanced teams just blow them up. Now, the other type of QB out there is the QB that is not going to be able to hide the holes. The holes will blow them up, all right? But what they can do is if you surround them with enough talent, they're not only going to get better, they're going to make that talent around them better. But they have to have talent. They can't take anybody and make them better. They, they need a little talent to work with. Uh, here in Philly, he found what was at Fulgham, I, I think was the, uh, was the wide receiver that's walked in off the street uh, that he's, he's getting a connection with. Uh, Wentz is a QB that can win for you, but he's not a QB that's going to hide a porous offensive line. That is not his skill set. And if you put him in that situation, it's not going to end out well for you. Yeah, and unfortunately, uh, Philadelphia just has not been the same as a team. I think there's something like 18 and 19 since their Super Bowl win, and about 12 of those wins have come from the Washington football team and the New York Giants. So, I mean, that goes to show you they are still – if anyone's having a Super Bowl hangover – City of Philadelphia is having one like no other. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's graduated from a hangover into a full blown issue. All right, that you know that they're going to have to deal with. All right, now well, uh, that's all for the show right now. We don't have enough time to do the last game. Sorry, <laughs> uh, we're doing it. We're doing it. Don't no, try to. We, we, we covered all the bases last night. <laughs> all right, well let's uh, let's cover the highlights again right now. Uh, Nate, I, I'm not going to sit here and throw up in my mouth. You do it. I, you want me to throw up in your mouth? Yeah, yeah, that would okay. be more pleasant than what we'll I did. We'll get two boys, one cut right here. Do you want an outsider to do it? There you go. Yeah. Uh, yes. Well, I just want to focus on the garbage time uh, touchdown by Amari Cooper. It was just a beautiful throw by Andy Dalton after he overthrew Michael Gallup about five times in the red zone. They finally got the touchdown. That's what I want to highlight about the game. Absolutely beautiful throw, garbage time touchdown. I, I just want to say that I have Amari Cooper on my fantasy team, and I was going up against Ezekiel Elliott. Um, so for personally, I'd like to thank them for that garbage time touchdown and Ezekiel Elliott dropping the ball a few times because I was able to win this week. Yeah, um, and but you, Tom, you've got to admit, you know, Elliott's going the extra mile this season. Uh, not only is he fumbling, he's doing it multiple times a game. Yeah, and, and I think they're trying – you know, I from what I've seen, again, thinking about that game. From, from what I've seen the last few years, you could say Ezekiel Elliott would be a decent receiving threat out of the backfield. You're not getting it that this year. They're trying to set up screen plays, and they are some of the most horrendous plays you can see. They just look out of sync, and this is something you don't expect from a running back and quarterback that have played together for the last three or four years and have won plenty of games and double digits amounts of games. I think there was um, a closing play at the end of the first half when Andy Dalton hits Mike, Michael Gallup in the hands and Gallup drops the, the touchdown. So, Van, I see you got your hands up. So what, what do you got to add in? Well, yeah, and, you know, I hear what you're saying and, and everything is, is valid. But it's like uh, back when I – in my troubleshooting IT days, okay, if you're, uh, if you're on a network and – one person in your, in your office has a problem with their computer. It's probably them or that computer. But if everybody in the building has a problem with their computer, it's the network. It's not their little individual computers. It's something on the network. And it's the same thing here. If we were talking about, well, Zeke is just not there, and that's a real problem this year, then I would be okay with that, but we're not. We're talking about Jalen Smith. We're talking about LVE. We're talking about the defensive line. We're talking about the defensive backs. We're talking about the offensive line. We're talking about the safeties, not even really wanting to give full effort. We're talking about people looking out of sync, not being ready. It's not the individual players. It's the freaking coaches. It's the scheme. It's the network, all right? 
All of these guys don't all of a sudden suck all at once. It's not them. I don't know about that. If you saw the touchdown to Christian Kirk, it, they were playing a simple cover three scheme, and he just got beat down the field when he had underneath coverage over there, and Daryl Worley sat there and looked like he saw a pair of tits for the first time. So, Yeah, Tom, you had your hand well up. I, I was going to say, do you think it's – finally showing that you know what Jason Garrett wasn't the problem because you came in with all you know Jerry Jones did his classic I'm gonna win the press conference brings in Mike McCarthy had a great run in Green Bay and dear God things get worse this is not what was supposed to happen and it's kind of reaching a point man you know you made the analogy with the network maybe it's not the network maybe it's the whole freaking internet and that that's Jerry Jones and Stephen Jones. Oh, that's my point. That's the network right there. Yeah, that's the network. I mean, uh, that, huh? that's that's my point. And you know, the, the coaches that they brought in are trying to change the culture in Big D. The, the problem with the culture is at the top, not at the bottom. Uh, and that's just the truth of it. Uh, on on the bright side, they do get Randy Gregory back next week. I understand. <laughs> So that should be a big plus. He should bring a lot of energy, I would think. But you've got players out there uh, that are not wanting to play. Yeah, it's when you look at, you know, the Dallas Cowboys, this was not what was expected. And they're going through a coaching change. I don't know if that impacted anything, but, you know, Nate, what, what do you think? What, what's the issue in Dallas? Well, I think it is. I mean, it starts from the top. I mean, the culture, the players know they work for Jerry and Steven. At the end of the day, and we're hearing, we're hearing a lot of turmoil in between the coaches and the players. Well, Jerry is a player's guy. He's going to side with them. Do you think he's actually going to give the, the coaches the backbone to actually step up and discipline them? No. So this is the culture that existed. It has existed since Jimmy Johnson has left. I mean, say what you will about Jason Garrett, the coach, but was he the actual problem? No. No. And I think, Nate, you know, you, you kind of hit it right on the head where, you know, Jerry Jones wants to run the show. And it, when you become head coach of the Dallas Cowboys, you pretty much become one of the fall guys. Um, and I feel like Jerry Jones does develop affection for his players. That's why I think Jason Garrett was there for so long as a head coach. He was a, backup quarterback for Dallas for several years. And, you know, he and Jerry Jones has been criticized for usually not this year, but there have been several times where he overpaid players to stay in Dallas that were basically, you know, not worth the money. Um, but of course the players that are worth the money, he doesn't resign, but that's a different, different topic for a different show. Yeah. And then that was, that was kind of Mike McCarthy's MO when he was in Green Bay. Ted Thompson ran the show when he was in Green Bay, never spent in free agency at all. Mm -hmm. um, basically, personnel decisions went solely to Ted Thompson, and he was the good guy, never complained, never did anything to ruffle feathers with Mike McCart with uh, Ted Thompson. Um, that's the way he operates, and that's why it was a perfect fit for Dallas. I mean, he, he was going to be that guy who was going to fall on the sword for Jerry. Yeah. You know, and you got to wonder too, you know, sometimes I wonder winning those three Super Bowls have been a curse for Dallas because it gave Jerry Jones the belief that he could just run everything. No, no. Yeah, winning the three Super Bowls is not the curse. Jerry Jones is the curse. All right, just, just, just call it the way it is. All right, look, that is the NFC East review. It is what it is. And we're going to close this out. Before we do, please, if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button down below, that notify bell. You can follow us on Twitter. You can find Nate on Twitter at No Remorse Sports. You can find Tom on Twitter at Defends underscore com. Myself at Stephen Vanover. And, of course, Sports Talk Line at Sports Talk Line. There was only one winning team in the NFC East last week. And that guy, Mr. Tom McAllister, is going to close us out. Yes, the best team in New York football, the New York Giants. We'll see what they do this week against Philly, see if we can put Philly further in a hole, or we get closer to Trevor Lawrence. We'll see what happens. See you next week, everyone. <laughs>